I'm Tari Tyrell, and I'm here with our research director, Dr. Margaret Bordeaux, who we also share with the Harvard Medical School, and our faculty director, Professor Juliet Kayam, who is a senior lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School. Each week, we will be answering some of your questions and concerns regarding the current pandemic and giving you some tips and tricks on how to stay sane and healthy during a crisis. Um, but first, let's hear a little bit from our experts, both on their backgrounds and what they've been up to this week. Uh, so Juliet and Margaret, how has your week been? I think it's been a while. Ooh, I, how's my week been? Hi, everyone. I, um, last week was a shock, even though, um, people like me had been pushing for it for a couple of weeks. Uh, the faster we can collectively and nationally pull the Band-Aid and start staying inside, the better. Um, but I think there was sort of adrenaline. So um, it was shocking that sort of came down this week. But I do feel like, I, I mean, work for Margaret and I is much more intense. So we have the weird thing that our kids now are home, but we're actually more busy than probably our spouses. Um, uh, because of the nature of our work. At least I don't have to move around anywhere. So I feel like I finally have a uh, battle rhythm. I finally got ear pods. So I do long walks on all my conference calls. So I feel like that's good. And I'm, I'm but um, the kids are bored, mine are teenagers. And, um, and so that's gonna be like the next battle. I have to be honest with you. I've been, I've let my guard down on, on video. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm still me, which I'm the faculty chair of the um, Security and Global Health and Homeland Security programs, have a history and background in state and federal government, academia, media, um, and um, private sector in basically risk reduction So um, and, um, and crisis management. So um, it's been, you know, if you can step outside of it, it's obviously been helpful. I think personally, it's been helpful to be um, useful, I think for me, um, just sitting on the sidelines probably would have been hard, but you also can get frustrated because you don't have authority. You know, you can't like, you're like standing there being like, I know how to do this. But anyway, so that's me heading over to Margaret, who's got four kids. I only have three. Oh, <laughs> well, I think we're in a similar headspace, Juliet. I, um, so, you know, I would think like most people, the last week has been a surreal experience. I mean, I, you know, and, and that's particularly true for me in, in, you know, in particular ways, but, um, you know, so I'm, I'm a physician. I am uh, at the uh, Brigham and Women's Division of Global Health. Um, and I, and so the, the sort of whole medical community, of course, is, is mobilizing in a, in a very um, acute, fast way. A lot of questions uh, from, you know, that community about what, uh, what to do, how to prepare, how are they going to prepare their own families uh, as they uh, think about working longer shifts in an exposed, you know, environment. So a lot of serious conversations happening there. You know, my, my, my research life and policy life has moved over into, uh, you know, in health security and thinking about uh, how we prepare for um, major health disasters and the intersection between health uh, emergencies and politics and policy. And so, you know, these are things I've been studying for, uh, well, many years, and now all of a sudden it's, it's in my backyard. And so uh, that's been, you know, a very busy time. And uh, fortunately, my husband has uh, been able to work from home, uh, but he and he's kind of shepherding the family through a lot of a lot of things. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's been surreal. And the kids are totally handling it like champs right now. Um, however, you know, there's just a lot of you know little grief about things that they're going to miss out on uh, the school play the. My oldest is in eighth grade and is about to go to high school next year and had a lot of events she wanted to do. And so, um, you know, just uh, sort of trying to help them, you know, manage and think about, you know, the pacing of this and how it's going to work out when there's so much uncertainty. Um, yeah, and then you know my dog. My dog is my dog is happy. She's the really really happy yes. member. She's yes. like everyone is here. This is great. I go on fifteen walks a day. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there uh, there's been a running joke in our house that the uh, the animals actually created COVID as a way to get us all. There's some truth in that. <laughs> there is some truth in that. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you for giving us a little bit more of a look into what your week has been. Um, something we want to do every week is collect questions from people both in the regular civilian sector and also people from within our Harvard community, people within the global health community. Um, we have a lot of questions and now that we have the two of you here, we'd love to get some answers. Um, so I think the first, you know, sort of most pressing question happening right now is we just got word, you know, over the last 12 hours or so that we officially have the most cases. Um, can you put that in a little bit of context? Is that a scary thing? Is that an expected thing? Um, what does that mean in terms of, you know, how we're doing globally? And can you just give us, you know, first, I guess, let's start with Margaret, just from the medical perspective, and then Juliet from the preparedness perspective. Sure. I, you know, that that is a big number. I am very dismayed, you know, that, that the United States is uh, in this position. Um, I do think that, and I'm dismayed because, you know, I, I, I do think that there are some things that we could have done a lot better to uh, not be in this position. Uh, but now that here we are, uh, you know, I think it's actually pretty clear what needs to, what needs to happen. And it's going to require a, a, quite a bit of uh, social mobilization as well as science like technology um, and a lot of policy management. I think the thing that I, because I'm very you know, connected to the global health world uh, and having a lot of very difficult conversations uh, you know, with folks who are thinking about how to support health systems in low and middle income countries. And it's one of these things where you know, often those conversations usually are happening in a context where people are like, well, you know, I don't really have to think about how Haiti's health system matters to me as an American. You know, I might think about it as a, you know, humanitarian or somebody who's interested in that country for some reason. But one of the things is that we're really seeing the interconnectedness of the globe. Uh, you know, so if we have a, a country that has a ton of cases uh, and it's and it's rampaging through their country, that has real implications for us as a nation because uh, we live in a globalized world. Uh, and so when we do start to open up and have an increased travel and things like that, you know, those the fates of folks in other places that maybe we don't think about all the time are going to be very uh, relevant to us. And Juliet, can you expand on that a little bit yeah. from the Homeland Security perspective? I mean, so as um, everyone's well aware, this is now, you know, in 50 states and it's, but it's the, uh, the United States sort of first 50 state disaster. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've had crises and tragedies that have impacted us all, but they've never galvanized the security, public safety or public health apparatus like this will. So you have competition among states for limited resources, um, uh, which we're well aware of, price gouging, um, and that's only gonna get worse. Um, I think the not having a national sort of everyone stay home for three weeks means that we're never even sure when the clock is hitting. Like, you know, we're here in Massachusetts. As we sat here, as we sit here, I just got an alert that Governor Baker is asking out-of-staters not to come into Massachusetts. And if they come into Massachusetts to quarantine for 14 days, this is in every state on their own now. So, and so as you're seeing the distribution, as you're seeing the numbers climb, we are comparatively the worst than worse than other countries because the distribution is so across the country. Italy was essentially able to isolate it, and certainly China was. Um, we we have failed in that regard, and so I just don't think we even have any model right now for what this is going to look like in the next couple of weeks. And this segues very neatly into our next question, which is, you know, we're well aware of the lack of testing. We're well aware of the PPE shortages and the shortages of just general medical equipment to give to the people on the front lines who are dealing with this medically. Um, Margaret, what's, what's your perspective as a doctor on this? And then, you know, Juliet, how do you think about this in terms of, you know, interflow between states, yes, you know, are, are states able to help out other states? Are we able to take in aid from other countries who have a better handle on this? You know, how does this impact, as you like to say, the flow of goods and people at a time when the flow of goods, you, you know, is, is quite a problem and we're coming up short? Yeah, this is extremely a uh, big issue right now for, for folks in the healthcare community of Boston, right? Uh, and we are uh, at the state level uh, in Massachusetts, 
you know, we are revving up to try to uh, have a centralized um, system of collection and distribution of PPE, because right now what's happening is the hos each hospital is on its own, right? Each hospital system. So they're each putting out calls. Uh, each public health commission is putting out calls for its own uh, PPE. And so, so on one hand, you know, they're, they're putting out their calls. The health workers are in a slightly better position, as I understand it today. You know, today is kind of okay. We have enough for a week and a half kind of thing. Um, but by the same token, you know, I'm just getting flooded with awesome, you know, requests like where can we donate? Where can yeah. we make masks and give them? Um, and so, you know, it's it's one of those things where we're, we're still trying to kind of put the plug in the socket. We're still trying to come up with that that organization that is going to allow all those people with resources and with time to, to make products like masks uh, to be able to give them to a place that they can be equitably distributed at the state level. Um, so, so that's where we stand with, with that. I just want to quickly say testing because testing has been you know all over. Each state is having to manage its relationship um, with the private sector to ramp up testing. And that's because we, you know, we, we didn't invest in our public health system for so many years that our public health systems by and large cannot, don't have the capacity to run tests. So that has made us wholly dependent on working with the private, not wholly, but very dependent on working with that private sector to rev up testing. And states that have that capacity, like Massachusetts, where we have a big private sector, biotech, et cetera, we are in an advantageous position to do that quickly. So and that's what you've seen. We've started to get to um, the governor's goal. We've started to meet, which is 4,000 tests a day in the state of Massachusetts, um, you know, and, and every single day and looking at trying, trying to uh, exceed that capacity as quickly as we can. Great. So there's a whole, you know, debate here behind that, which is, of course, the, 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 the tools for response that are available to a president um, during any response. People will have heard of the Defense Production Act, um, which gives a president, um, well, I should be clear here, and something that most reporters aren't picking up on, the Defense Production Act was a, a post-Korea War statute that allowed a president to take, to, to uh, do a couple things, prioritize uh, manufacturing, but pay, everyone is talking about as a taking. So you just pay at the fair market value, uh, prioritize quantity and type, um, take stuff if it's in the warehouses, but also again, pay and then distribute it to control the supply chain. Because as Margaret was saying, what's happening in New York now is just phase, I mean, we've got 49 states behind New York and even if only half of them get lucky, um, that's a huge toll. So we've got to pace this and only, only the federal government can. The president has not invoked the Defense Production Act. A lot of us um, uh, have been urging to, but let me just finish my thought before, sorry, that um, the Defense Production Act was amended after the Department of Homeland Security was created so that it could be utilized for homeland defense. So it's not some antiquated law. It actually legislatures looked at it and said, you know what, we could conceive of a scenario in which for homeland defense purposes, you know, we need to do this. And so it's just important, like, so the law's really rational. It and and we should just, you know, I've been joking that like, because I'm Lebanese American, that we should have the Lebanese take over the supply chain because we'd like inevitably over order. And that's fine. Like just I don't understand. Like if you're if you're fighting a war and your gun takes eight bullets you don't just make eight bullets because the presumption is you are going to need more bullets. And that's just the frustrating thing right now is that we just know that the time frame is very far down, very, very long. Yeah. And so, you know, as we're, we're talking about sort of the expansive nationwide response to this and even with, between other nations, you know, we're, we're also getting a lot of questions from people at home, you know, who want to sew masks. Uh, we have a friend who was an engineer who was looking to 3D print something that you can put an N95 filter in. You know, what, what can the average American do? You know, what can people do outside of both the government and, and private sectors to, to feel like they're doing their part here other than stay home? Is there anything you'd recommend? Yeah. Hmm. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. You're. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so I, I do want to just, I want to answer that question. I want to back up and put it in the context of what a, a robust public health response should look like. 
Okay, so what it should look like is it should have at this point with this type of disease, we should have four elements. Okay, we should have case finding. That means that basically we need to go on the, the hunt for this virus. We need to go chase it yeah. down and, and corner it. Okay, so the case finding is really important and the testing is part of that. The second thing though is contact tracing. Even, even when we're at the very peak of this, even when it's gone out of control and you know, we know we're struggling with it, we need contact tracers. So those are people that help um, think through and contact every person that a, a person with the disease has. And that requires really significant social mobilization. Okay, that probably will take place uh, uh, when it does stand up through a phone bank, it'll be a virtual uh, contact tracing operation. But, you know, that's something I think people should be offered an opportunity to get involved with, okay? Um, because that will require people with, from many different communities who speak different languages uh, to be able to reach out to folks and, and help them um, understand they've been in contact with somebody who's been sick and know where to go for testing and then follow up with that person through their quarantine. So if you've been exposed but are negative, you need to stay at home and you need to be isolated from others. Yep. Um, and that's gonna require like, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, of uh, volunteers and, uh, and, and maybe paid workers to go out and help people get resources while they're staying at home. And I just wanna put this in context, like in Toronto during the SARS epidemic, they, they had 24,000 people in quarantine that yeah. for two weeks, they couldn't leave. And there was a massive mobilization of help to help uh, those folks in quarantine uh, have food delivered, have resources delivered, if they had mental health, uh, needed some mental health support, have counseling set up for them, uh, you know, over um, over the wires. So, you know, I I think that that is not getting enough play right now. That's really where we need to to drive is community mobilization, in addition to scientific, you know, surging with vaccine development and test new kinds of tests, etc. So I think that that's what folks should be on the lookout for. And that's really where I'm trying to drive the policy conversation right now in the response is the need for that. Yeah, I think um, that's really helpful. I think like, um, I mean, if you ask sort of, you know, wh where are we going, which is the inevitable question after what just happened, you know, like, I feel like, you know, it's like, what just happened? Where are we going? Um, I, you know, on the preparedness and, and Homeland Security side, I bet, you know, I think if you, if you viewed last week as the light switch, like it just felt like everything went on and off, went from on to off. And that experience, I'm trying to walk a lot. That's just that experience of being on walks and you're just walking on these crowded urban streets and you're like, this is just weird. Or looking at Memorial Drive or Starro Drive where I live in Cambridge and, you know, maybe a couple of trucks come by, but um, uh, is um, the, the, the opening back up is going to be more like a, a dimmer that, that I think that you're going to have the ups and downs. And, and so I just think that that's a way to think about it. And, and the reason why it's going to be dim, a dimmer is, and this is why we're good partners, is what Margaret explained is that when you do find some, let's say you would have find someone, right? So you could, it could be that an entire school is exposed by that person. If that person's a teacher, well, you're gonna have to shut down the school because if you don't shut it down, then those people are gonna all live those their lives. So it's just, it's, it's whack-a-mole and there's just no other way to describe it until we ultimately have a vaccine. But the truth is we can do this. I mean, we can live, it's not eradication. The standard in Homeland Security is management. We're managing the virus. And so just if people could think about that way, and maybe psychologically we'd be better off for ourselves, but also for our kids to not talk about when are we getting back to normal? That's just not the appropriate standard anymore. Yeah. So in the interim, and um, we are drawing to a close now, you know, we've moved on from, you know, sort of the bigger picture now to this, the community picture and now to the individual picture. Um, you know, what day to day is happening inside these houses, these four walls that we're all trapped in um, with various family members. Um, so, you know, there's something that, you know, can be done both from a sanitation perspective, but also from a sanity perspective. So if I yeah. can get a tip from each of you, you know, what's your one sanitation tip for the week to keep oh. you physically healthy? And what would you recommend for the average person at home just to keep themselves mentally healthy? Yeah. 
I, um, well, I'll be, I, I'm just, it, it, it's not rocket science as the non doctor on the panel, uh, just washing my hands all the time on my own personal sanity. Um, um, I did a little bit of upkeep yesterday. I just, I sort of felt my whole body sort of, you know, um, and did my nails and, and whatever that matters to me may not matter to other people on the kids front. Um, I had, I sort of knew what the time frame would be. I knew I'm, I'm in my head as I've written, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, uh, we're lucky if we're out of here by May. Um, I'm, um, I had sort of said to my husband, we're going to give them the first two weeks chill. Um, it, it, Cause my kids are teenagers. I don't know. I mean, they got so much going on in their brains anyway, but they also know what's going on. So, and they know the details of what's going on, right? So they, so I, uh, one is in college and came back, she's in spring break. The two who are teen, two boys who are teenagers, they've had minimal work. It's sort of ratcheting up next week. And I, you know, I said all rules about screen time and stuff. I just said, you know what, these two weeks, God knows someone, I heard someone say that, that our kids are going to be called Generation uh, C for the coronavirus. Um, will they be more resilient or more scared? I don't know, you know, but it's got to be wacky for them. So I guess the last thing I'd say is I did ask them both, all three of them both, all three of them to journal that I think that, you know, even if it's five minutes, even if it's on their notes on their iPhone, because God, this is this, if this is wacky for us, my God, for the kids. And Margaret, I know you have four daughters at home yeah. who are also yeah. dealing with this. And uh, so, you know, both in, in terms of their physical health and your mental health, how are you handling it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a fabulous, such a fabulous, important point. I, I guess I, I have three things I would just like to comment on. You know, when in public health, when you ask people to quarantine, quarantine is when, you know, you're not sick, uh, but you've been exposed. Okay. And that's going to be different than isolation. Isolation is for people who are sick. Okay. And I, I do want to get back to how, how to help people in isolation, but in quarantine or in lockdowns, or, you know, when we're really having to restrict our movement, I think, you know, one of the things we think about in public health is what about people who are having to be in a house with other people who they really do not get along with, right? Um, or what about people who really do um, have, uh, you know, need some mental health support? Uh, and so um, one thing I'm just to pass along that I was really pleased about in Massachusetts is they put together a phone number called 211 for all information yeah. about coronavirus, 211. Um, and one of the things on the menu, you know, get a, a recorded answer, but one of the, and then you press through options and you can talk to to actual people. But one of the options was if you have a mental, uh, you need some mental health support, there is, that is part of that uh, phone number. So 211. Um, in terms of, of, of myself, so I did the same thing with my kids and I was just like two weeks. I, I, I don't personally have the bandwidth to do any, any otherwise. So the kids are kind of on their own. It's one of the times when having four actually really helps uh, because yeah. they do sort of entertain. I think about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, the one thing that I, I have reflected on is, um, and this is again, just very personal, but I get tired of thinking about other people <laughs> I get tired of thinking about human problems and, uh, you know, I get frustrated with human problems. So I really love to watch things grow or something non-human. I love plants. I love to look at my backyard and watch the birds. Um, and I, that would be my, my pro tip is, you know, think about uh, any other species for just like one minute a day, you know, look out, make it, maybe, you know, take note of the birds who are starting to build nests in the back. Even the squirrels are kind of doing some interesting things out there. We have a lot of turkeys in our backyard um, here. So, so there's lots to watch. And I think just taking yourself out of that mind frame of like constantly worrying and responding to other people's needs and, and even your own. So that's my little pro tip. Yep. Yeah, plant to plant. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you both. Um, we have so many more questions to answer next week. And of course, this is, as everyone is saying, a fluid situation. Um, so this is only the first of many of these sessions that we're attempting to do weekly. Um, so do please stay tuned to our Belfer Center, Center channels, which are the official channels, as well as our Twitter accounts. Juliet's account, of course, will be posting these videos and soliciting questions as well. And until next time, thank you and be well.